I uh, have heard Patty speak several times, and I've heard her story here at Cornerstone and in Mexico. And so I was listening to her this, listening, listening to her this morning, and I thought, you know what, I, I want to start the message with something that I hadn't prepared in the week. And so this slide's not going to be up there, but I want to start things off um, by reminding all of us in the room that God really changes lives, right? I mean, isn't that an example of that? And there are times that you wonder, does he really do this? Can he do this? And you see, hear a story like Patty's, and you're like, of course he does. Isaiah 61 is an incredible passage, and I want to describe it here in a moment. If you, it's not on the screen. You can follow um, if you have your own Bible, but I'll, I'll read it to you. In this passage, uh, you see Patty's story illustrated. But here's what's neat about Isaiah 61. It's a vision for everyone's life, okay? Uh, it's the picture of what God wants to do in our life, a place that he wants to take us. And so Isaiah 61 includes three groups of people. And the first one is actually Jesus himself. It starts off this way. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me. And then he goes into this long list I'll read in a moment. Jesus quoted this in a synagogue one day saying that I'm here. Uh, he has this special anointing. He was the one that was to, to come and bring peace and justice into the world in a way that had never been done before. Jesus is different than all of us. Uh, Jesus comes for everyone, not just a few people, but he comes for everyone, and he comes to touch their lives and make a difference. He's got this special anointing. Uh, the Lord's Spirit is on him in a special way to do amazing things. And here is what it is that he came to do, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion and bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. He's describing the second group here. So you have Jesus and now you have a second group. And the second group are those people who mourn. Those that suffer, those that find themselves in need, whether it's physical poverty or spiritual poverty, those that say, you know, I've experienced ashes in my life. And ashes is this ancient illustration of death. So it doesn't just have to be physical death. Maybe you're missing someone that, you, um, that you've loved. Uh, maybe it's just death of a dream or death of something in your life that you've had to lose something. Jesus comes for people who are hurting. Jesus comes to people whose lives have been shattered, lives that are broken. And even if it's not just a, um, a, a physical plight that they're going through, he comes for the people whose hearts are broken, whose hearts are empty. This is Jesus. He comes. So Jesus is different than us. The second group of people reflects all of us, okay? Everyone in the world. We all can connect with despair and mourning and brokenness. He comes for people just like us. But there's a third group of people. And this third group of people are only people who get to this place because they allow Jesus to enter into their life and begin to put back together the pieces of a broken world, the pieces of a broken life. Look what it says as the passage ends. He says, you know, I'm going to change all this. I'm going to take the spirit of despair and give him a garment of praise. And then look what he says of these people. This is the vision. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So this is about God, God getting the credit. But look what he says. He says, oaks of righteousness. Now, many of you don't find that as a, to be a compliment, okay, or a vision to be called a tree, all right, a big, powerful tree, especially the women in the room don't want to be called a big, powerful tree. But I want to tell you what this is. This is the Hebrew word ayil, and ayil is an incredible word, and it, and it means strong ones. The closest equivalent we have in modern language is when we say that someone is a stud, okay, <laughs> all right? This is what it's saying. Jesus comes to people whose lives are broken and hurting, and he turns them into aiels, into studs. Let me tell you how the word aiel is used in the scripture. It's used to describe the brave men of a tribe who would go out and fight for people who couldn't fight for themselves. Those that were brave and had courage when no one else did. They're aiels. It's used to describe the wise men and women of a tribe who would make choices and um, they would think about the care of the entire community and they make good, wise choices that would benefit everybody. It's the wise ones. Ayil is used to describe um, the strongest posts in a building. So, you know, if an ancient Hebrew were to walk in here and they would see these, these pillars on the side of our auditorium that are holding up the roof so it doesn't crush us, they would say, that's not a pillar, that's an ayil. It's the strong posts that carry the heaviest load. 
See, right here it says you're an Aiel. God turns you into an Aiel, the one that can carry a heavy load for others. And then the last use of the word is this mention of a tree. The Aiels were uh, used to describe the biggest, the, the most prominent trees. And so in the Middle East, there were, you know, a lot of trees a lot in, in ancient times, but there weren't very many large trees. And the oaks were the largest trees. And so they would stand out and they would be markers on people's way for trying to find their way. So it would point them in the right direction. The big trees would provide shade and comfort and shelter. And it was out of that wood that they would build uh, the, the strongest buildings and, and the things that mattered most to them in their buildings. So Jesus comes to people who are broken, that are weak, that are sad, that are dealing with the crud of the, the world. And when people allow him to come into their life, you know what he does? He doesn't just pull them out of the hole. He turns them into a strong one. And Patty is a strong one, right? She's a strong one. It's amazing. A victim now to an advocate. She stands in front of her, uh, her pimp and can say, I forgive you. The Lord did something in her life. And she's not just out of that hole, but she is a completely different person. She is an I.O. Let me tell you something. That is God's vision for all of us. No matter where you're at, what you've gone through, what you will go through. That's what Jesus does. He enters people's lives, and he doesn't just say, I'm pulling you out of the hole. He's saying, you know what? I'm gonna make, you're going to make a difference. You're going to do something incredible with your life. There are no ordinary lives. Yours can be special. You're an I.O. So I just wanted to start that way because I wanted you to see who was in front of you today. But I want you to know who's sitting around you, too. There are I.O.s in this room. And so now I have this, the challenge of trying to transition to my message, which that doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. But let's, it does a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, so we're in migration, and we're trying to move from vices to virtue, and we chose today the virtue of justice, knowing that Patty and Fernanda would be here. If you think about justice, the way the scriptures talk about it, it's about doing good for others or doing good with others. Uh, but it's even more than that. It's more than being fair. It's more than being good. The way the scriptures describe um, justice is with a special word. It's a Hebrew word called zedekah, or some people say zedaka. That's also a word that was in the passage we just read, the righteous ones, okay, righteous oaks. Here's what I want you to think of when you think of justice. I don't want you just to think about fairness and doing good for others. I want you to have this picture that comes with uh, the idea of Zedekah. This is what Zedekah means. It means to put back together the pieces of a broken world. It means to heal a, a, a sick planet. It means to heal hurting hearts. It means to involve yourself in a world that's shattered and to pick up one piece at a time and help to put it back together. And so I love the image of a puzzle that's in pieces. It's not together the way it should be. It doesn't look the way that it should be, but the pieces are there. And so one at a time, you take a piece and you put it together. And as you do that, it begins to look more and more the way the puzzle's supposed to look. When we act out of justice, we are one at a time putting together the pieces of a broken world, shattered world, chaotic world. And you know what the Lord does? He's moving the world towards the world that he wants it to be. Uh, justice is about bringing about God's idea for the planet, God's idea for people, God's idea for the world. So that's what we're after. Injustice is easy to see. Um, there's the big ones like abortion, slavery, terrorism. I mean, I'm just thinking today is the anniversary of 9-11. Remember when that happened? I mean, I wasn't in New York, but I felt violated. It was, it, you don't have to tell someone that that's wrong. You think of other things like uh, displaced people and the refugee crisis in the world today and pornography and urban plight. And then there's less obvious forms of injustice like fraud. I read this week that uh, people in every demographic in our country, many of them are participating in fraud. It's not just the rich that are doing so, it's everyone. Um, so there's things like welfare pr fraud, insurance fraud, tax fraud, and then of course there's corporate fraud. It's unjust. Uh, when, a, when a bully beats up kids on the playground, it's unjust. And God is against all of it. That's brokenness that the Lord is against. But the Lord is about bringing about justice, Zedekah in the world, bringing together those broken pieces. Now, I want to describe, though, the dilemma for me. <clears throat> and maybe it's the dilemma for you, because what we're trying to do is move from apathy to justice. Notice that the vice is not exploitation or oppression. I know most of you, and you're wonderful people, and you don't hurt people on purpose, and you're not about reinforcing oppressive systems. You're good people, 
And so it's not exploitation and, suff- or, uh, and selfishness and all these other things that are keeping you from justice. It's the same thing that keeps me from justice. It's apathy. And apathy is dis- defined as a lack of interest or excitement about something. Or when you think about it in terms of justice, what the Lord is calling us to do, Zedekah, apathy is a lack of action or a lack of movement towards justice. And it really is the thing that keeps people like us from living out justice. It's apathy. So here's the dilemma, and you'll see how these two live in relationship, unfortunately for me. So this is a dilemma. It's a question. It becomes a contradiction in my life, unfortunately. I love the way that the Bible describes God as a God of justice. I love that the anchor story in the Old Testament is a story of God freeing his people who were slaves. I love that. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 7 and 9, it says, The Lord heard their cry, their oppressive cry, and he reached out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm to save them. I love verses like Isaiah chapter 63, verse 8, that says, For I, the Lord, love justice. And then look what he hates. You can see it behind me. I love that we're told that he's close to the brokenhearted. And in places like Psalm 146, it says, he upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. I love that we read about a God who cares about the orphan and the widow and the alien and those that suffer. I love that. I like that Jesus was born into a very unjust social and political setting. I love that Jesus was born to a poor family. I love that he was a simple carpenter. I love that his family struggled to put food on the table, but even when that was happening, Jesus always had his attention turned towards people around him who were hurting. And so Jesus lived his life every day on behalf of the least of these around him, even though he had his own problems. I love that about him. I love that in Matthew 25, when people are saying, Lord, what what, what are the things that really matter to God? He says, whether or not you cared for the least of these. I love that. I have conversations with atheists uh, pretty frequently, and I often start off by saying, let me tell you about the God of the Bible, and I start going into all this stuff, and I'm saying, isn't it great? Isn't he great? And they'll say, well, if there was a God, it would be great if he were like this. In other words, they're saying if there's a God worth believing in, it would be a God like this. See, I love the justice of God. That's not the problem. The problem, the dilemma, the contradiction for me is that I don't always love what he asks me to do to bring about the justice of God. I don't love that Jesus directly speaks to my apathy in the process. I don't love that his chosen way of Zedekah is to use his people. I don't always love that. I don't always like the effort that's required to fight injustice. I don't love the service that is required to help pick up the pieces of someone's life. I don't like the sacrifice that's required to go stick with someone long enough to to really make a difference. If I'm honest, I don't always love that. Why? Because of apathy. Proverbs 28, 27 is not one of my favorite verses. It says, those who give to the poor will lack nothing. Well, that part's cool, but what about this? But those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. Proverbs 21, 13, whoever shuts the, their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. You can't read the Bible and say that this stuff's not important to God. But that creates a dilemma. What do we do? What do we do with our apathy that, you know, more often than not, we choose apathy instead of justice? Now, nowhere in the Bible do, does this issue of apathy as it relates to justice get uh, addressed more than in Isaiah chapter 58. So I'm just going to describe it to you, and you can read it behind me for just sake of time. Here's what's taking place. Um, you have a lot of very devoted people to God. They love him. They show up uh, at their services to worship. They offer saf- sacrifices. They might even give an offering. They're, they, we're even told that they, they seek God out every day, or they might even read the scriptures every day. Here in Isaiah, we have people like that, devoted people, people a lot like us, okay? But in the passage... There's a problem. We see that they're confused, that they're unsettled. They're not content with their spirituality because they're saying things like, God, it seems like you're far from me. God, it seems like you're not listening to me. You're not answering our prayers. And God speaks through the prophet Isaiah right to their heart. I mean, this is one of those oh crap moments, like when you've ever been caught and it's just, you see it on your face. 
Uh, people can see it on your face. This is what happens. It's, it's so direct, speaking to exactly what the problem is. And the Lord says this. You know what? You've been spending your time offering all these incredible fasts and sacrifices in your worships the way that you think it should be. But you know what? I don't accept it because you've forgotten justice. There's a lot of religion taking place, but not a lot of justice. And because of that, there's a problem, at least from God's view. Uh, There's a lot of trying to do the religious thing. There's a lot of apathy with that. And so because of that, God is saying, you know, I, I don't feel honored. You're not representing me. I don't see your devotion because there's a problem. There is religion. There is worship, but there is no justice. There is no love for other people. There is no zedekah. If you continue to read in Isaiah 58, he says, come back to that. That's who you are. That's what he's saying to the ancient Jews. It's what he says to God's people today everywhere. Come back to this. And when you do, there are incredible blessings that come along with this. But their problem is our problem. You know, a lot of times we read in the Bible and we read about people who make mistakes and we're like, oh my gosh, how could they do that? How could they do that? We do the same thing, right? Listen to what Abraham Heschel says about apathy. He's, he's just, he's got so many great things to say, but especially about justice. You can see the quote behind me. He says, it is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. And what he's talking about with religion is, is faith in the God of the Bible, you know, Jewish faith, Christian faith. He says, it would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religions decline not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When faith is, listen to this, when faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with a voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. That's Isaiah 58 in 20th century language. Here's another way to describe Isaiah 58. This is from Maria of Paris. I love reading people from history, so you guys have to put up with me nerding out all the time. Here's one of those quotes. She's the orthodox version of Mother Teresa. She cared for the poor in Paris. She was being uh, criticized by some of her religious bosses up above her because she, she didn't dress the way nuns should dress. She, she would like look shabby for a nun. And she smoked and she went out and drank with the working men. She would meet him at a pub and she would tell him about Jesus. And she did a whole bunch of others. I mean, she's awesome. All right. Let's <coughs> yeah, we need people like this, but you know what she did every day. She woke up and she lived for others. She had understood Isaiah 58 because God has touched you. She had understood Isaiah 61 because God has touched her life so much. She was going to live differently. And this is what she said to a friend during some of the criticism. She said, at the last judgment, I will not be asked whether I satisfactory practiced asceticism nor how many bows I made before the divine altar. I will be asked whether I fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the sick, and the prisoner in his jail. That's what I'll be asked. By the way, she was also a, a woman of deep conviction about personal faith. So she was telling people all along the way about their need for Jesus. She's describing Isaiah 58, and she's mentioning something that will take place in the future that modern people don't like to think about, and it's the judgments that we face. The scriptures describe a number of judgments. There's two that are are really significant. The first is a judgment of faith. Do you know Jesus? He's the way to eternal life. But there's a second judgment that has to do with the way we live. We don't like the idea as modern people that we'll be held accountable for the way we live. That bothers us in our fierce individualism, right? But that's what's facing many people. That's what's facing all of us. And she understands that. And she says, you know, at the end of the day, I want to stand before the Lord. I want to lay my life out and say, this is what I did for others. And she's really wanting to hear from the Lord, good and faithful servant. Well done. So we're challenged. I'm challenged to move out of apathy to justice. This is important. Because this is how God shows the world what he is like. This is how God loves the world. But this is how he shows the world who he is. So I want to describe it this way. These are our colors, okay? Love, justice, righteous acts. That's what Zedekah means, to act rightly in a righteous way, to do righteous acts, to do just acts, to love. These are our colors. 
This week, I had a very, very fun time with football, okay? You know that I love it, and I talk about it too much. But I want to illustrate it. I, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. On Thursday night, or Thursday morning, I woke up fully alive because the Broncos were playing that day. And I put on my orange and blue and my Bronco stuff, and I paraded around wherever I was at so that people could know that I'm with the Broncos. All right? They're my team. The next night, my son Wyatt play, or Levi played in a football game, and I'm his coach. So I put on the shirt for the Louisville Little Giants to say, I'm with this team. These are my colors tonight. On Saturday, I coached in my son's son Cole's football game, so I put on maroon and the Lafayette bo Bobcat colors and said, these are my colors. And then later on that day, I put on black and gold because the Buffs played. I want everyone to know who my teams are. It's a little weird. Okay, I have another team that matters more than all of those teams. There's someone that I want to represent well more than I want to represent those teams. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't give us hats to wear. He doesn't give us a uniform. Thank goodness, thank God that I don't have to wear a robe. <laughs> you know what our colors are? Love. In Colossians it says, put on love above all other things. Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples by love. And it's not some generic type of love, like just affection towards people. It's a love that acts, that goes the extra mile. The Hesed type of love that we've described here. The love of justice. Those are your colors. Jesus went out of his way to say, you know what? They won't know you're on my team by your theology or your worship services or where you worship. They'll know you're on my team by your justice, your love, your righteous acts. These are his words. And so it's important that we represent him. And so the question becomes, how do you do this? And how do you do this well? And if you're like me, you can be over, overwhelmed by all the problems in the world. I mean, you can watch the news and be overwhelmed by the suffering in the world, right? Uh, if you just open yourself up to this type of thing, you're going to be asked a million times to help out in some way. And it can be overwhelming. And so where do we start? Well, this is something Andy and I do here on staff. We, we kind of coach people on how to get involved. This is what we tell them. It's not very smart at all, it makes, but it's very simple. We say start with one thing. Start with one issue. Start with one neighbor. Start with one person. Start with one event. Start with one project. Start with one thing because that is manageable. And then do that one thing and see what the Lord says is next. Here's what else is neat about this idea of one when it comes to serving the poor. Jesus actually said, whatever you did for one of, one of the least of these you did unto me. Okay, he made a point to bring out the one. But when you can focus in on one thing, here's what will happen. Your efforts, whether it's financial efforts or your talent and your possession, or, or your talent and uh, um, your, your leadership or whatever it is, it won't be diluted into 10 different things. Maybe you have time to do all of those things, but maybe you don't. Maybe you have time for one thing. And if you choose to walk down the path of one, you're going to be able to bring all of yourself and your efforts are going to go much further. We meet with people all the time that say, you know what, I wish I could get more involved in things like Reintegra or your refugee ministry or, or serve on a board and something in the community that's caring for people who are suffering. And we'll say, well, why can't you? And then they'll, they'll say things like, you know what, I've been taking care of these single mothers and um, I'm also a, a part of reading to kids at Ryan Elementary. And we'll say to them, you're doing it. Please don't say yes to those other things. Be faithful with the place that you already are. And so rather than feeling guilty about what we're not doing, let's focus on the one thing the Lord has called us to do. Uh, Maria Paris has another great quote. I actually have it in my phone that I see often. She says this. She says, love the world the way you experience it or the world that you live in. Don't love the world the way you want it to be. Love the world the way it is. And when you do that, you'll experience a living God right there. He's going to meet you in that place. So start with one. But here is the key, and I want to end with this as the worship team comes out. If you want to make the migration, if I want to make the migration from apathy to justice, it's not just about starting with one thing and seeing if that might build. It is about being moved in the core of who you are by justice. And I want to remind most of the people in this room that you already have been moved by justice. Because I know most of the people in this room 
are living in relationship with Jesus. There are people that aren't, so you want to listen because it's an invitation for you as well to start this relationship. But most of the people in this room have invited Jesus to come in and be a part of their life. And you understand the gospel. You understand that the gospel is how God sat in heaven and he looked down on us and he saw that we were in danger. And even though you might not be physically poor, he saw that you were spiritually poor and bankrupt. Just like that's what he sees when he looks at me. And so he moved towards us. He avoided apathy and moved towards us in justice. And there are many people in this room that have experienced the gospel where you, you realize that you needed Jesus to pull you out of a hole that you could not get out of yourself. That we were powerless to deal with sin. That we're weak and powerless to deal with the effects of sin. And the effects of sin are eternal. Not just temporal or material. They're eternal. We're trapped in our vices. We're trapped in our constant tr struggles, and we need a saving. We need a rescuing. We need a ransom. And so the most just thing that's ever been done for anyone was a God who lived in heaven, who had everything, who gave it all up to come down here to take our death. And then three days later, when he rose from the grave, he said, you know what's good news? It's not just good news that I took your death. I want to give you my life. That was the most just thing that's ever been done. If you've said yes to that story and invited Jesus into your life, you have been moved by justice. But here's the problem. We often forget that the gospel is a just act, and we stop being grateful for it. I don't want to take it for granted a day of my life, but you know what? I do it all the time. When you're grateful for the justice of Jesus, guess what happens? You have a full heart, and you have justice to give. We cannot continually give away something that we first don't receive. And there are a lot of people, not just in this room, but all around the world that have at one point in their life given their life to Jesus, they've been touched by justice, but they're no longer affected by it. Because the gospel is just something in the past rather than the work of God in my life right now. I'll be the first to say, without him, I would be a disaster, a mess. Not only would I be miserable, but I would cause misery. Because on my own, I'm very selfish and very mean. See, I need him today. So we need moved by justice. If you don't know him today, invite him in and experience the justice of God, the gospel in your life. But here's the second way I want you to think about being moved by justice. I want you to imagine right now, wherever you sit, that there is a circle around you. Okay? With kids, we, we use a hula hoop. So you can picture a hula hoop if you want. And inside that circle is everything that's a part of your life. So your ambition, your career, your possessions, um, your talent, but it, it also includes your whole story. So your defeats, your losses, your wounds, the things you don't want anyone to know. This is all part of who you are, okay? This is your life. Whatever makes up your life, it's all inside that circle. Most people live their lives and unfortunately too many Christians live their lives at the center of their circle where they say you know what I'm in charge I'm in control of everything that is in this circle and when someone enters into my circle and they don't do what I want them to I re respond harshly because I'm, in, I'm the boss I call the shots I do what I want to do it all exists for me it's the old idea that we're the center of the universe the problem is we all think we're the center of the universe. And so we bump into each other. Here's how we need moved by justice. We don't need to just say, Jesus, come and be a part of my life. You know what needs to happen? We need moved off the center spot. We need to move to the side and say to Jesus, you're the center. You're in charge. You sit on the throne. You point the direction you want me to go. You tell me to do uh, to use the skills I have the way you want them to. What matters to you, God, matters to me. Your dreams are my dreams. You're in control. And even if I don't feel excited about what God is asking me to do because he's on the throne and he's in the center, his way wins. I will never live out justice the way the scriptures describe them. If I don't first let Jesus into my life and then say, all right, you're you're in charge. I must move off the center 
out of control, out of self-focus, consumed with just my own thoughts, my own dreams, and say, you know what, God? Life is about you. You're there. When that happens, you know what? Acts of justice become more and more natural, and they become the joy of your life. You hear all the time people saying, you know, I thought it would cost me so much, but I'm the one that's received so much. They're just describing the joy that comes from living life the way God asks us to because there is blessing that comes. And so I want to pray for us. Let's bow our heads. And I want to pray two simple prayers. And the first is I want to give anyone in the room that has never invited Jesus to be a part of their life. You've never experienced the justice of Jesus who comes to you in the poverty of your your spirit, trapped in your sin, oppressed by your vices. You've never asked him to come and save you and to forgive you and to rescue you. I want to pray a prayer that you can pray with me quietly and invite him in. So Jesus, today is the day that I want to invite you into my life. I recognize my need for you. I recognize that my need is much greater than just physical suffering. Lord, I understand that I've put myself in this place through sin, that I am weak to overcome my own struggles, that I can't deal with the consequences of sin on my own. And so I ask for help. Come and be my savior. Forgive what needs to be forgiven. And Lord, lift me out this trap, this hole that I put myself in. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for the justice of God that has allowed you to move towards me. And secondly, I want to pray this prayer for those in the room that maybe you've known him for a while, but you're just like me, and today you're like, you know what? It's usually apathy instead of justice, but I want to move from apathy to justice. Let's put the Lord back at the center and let his dream be our dream. So Father, we confess that we take control of our life, that we live for ourselves, and that we don't live for you often. So today, Lord, we wanna turn from that and we wanna put you back in the center and say that you're in control. And we say yes to your ways and we say yes to your dream and we say yes to the ways that you wanna use us and the ways that you want us to live. We say yes to that. And so, Lord, speak to us. Show us what you want. And, Father, we need help. We need help to trust you. We need help with our unbelief. And so give us what we need to keep you in that spot. Lord, I pray for our church that we would continue to grow in justice. Thank you for the ways that you've changed us this last decade. I pray for more. We pray for more great stories. We pray for more justice than apathy. And we bless this message in your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.